Before I begin my uh, lecture for today, I uh, just want to make a few uh, very quick announcements. Uh, uh, the first is that if there's anyone in this class who wasn't here last week, I, uh, there was no class on Thursday. Um, and uh, for those of you who missed the class on Tuesday, uh, just mm, you know, talk to some fellow student in the class to find out, obviously, uh, what happened. Uh, secondly, as I pointed out before, I'd like you to put your cell phones away for the entire duration of the class. Um, and uh, all of the PowerPoint slides, I have mentioned this before, I'll re 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 reiterate it at this juncture and maybe mention it once more uh, later on, but they will be made available to you every three weeks approximately. I'm not going to put them up every week, but every three weeks or so, you know, they will be put up. Uh, and finally, for, uh, uh, for Thursday's class, uh, and that's the general rule to follow uh, for every week, make sure you've seen the film before you come to class, all right, um, and, and have done the reading, obviously. So that entire week's reading should be done uh, by the Tuesday uh, of the week. That's the preferred mode, uh, because there will be times when uh, the reading will cross over from Tuesday into Thursday, uh, and on Thursday it may, re may make references back to the reading on Tuesday. And if possible, you should try to bring the readings uh, with you to class, at least the main reading, uh, because often I might uh, refer uh, to the reading. Uh, now I have one further thing I want to very briefly discuss with you, uh, get a general kind of sense of opinion in this class. It is possible for me to arrange a screening uh, of most of the films that we can see in common, uh, provided there's any interest in doing so. And if you know three of you said you would show up and only one showed up, it's not really worth the trouble uh, for the department. I mean, really, the, almost everyone or the vast majority of you would have to show up. Uh, we would do that on an evening when generally there are no classes. I'm assuming there are no classes that anyone has uh, after 6. So for example, as an illustration, uh, we could do it on a Tuesday evening. Uh, so uh, let's say we began next Tuesday. Then we would see the film for week 4. OK, because next Tuesday is week three. So obviously, we're not going to see the film uh, that Tuesday evening, because you're supposed to have seen it before you come to class on Tuesday. So you'd see the, week, the film for week four. And then, or we could do it on a Thursday. I only want to, I'm really only available to do it on a Tuesday or a Thursday. So, uh, and it would be in the history department conference room, most likely. Uh, but I'm told that that's possible. Uh, and uh, we would probably do it from six. Most of these films are about two and a half hours. Uh, Lagan, we're not going to do it. I'm just letting you know right now because we're going to be here all evening. But you know, we'll probably finish at about 8.30. And then if you're interested, we can go have pizza and beer or something like that some of those evenings. You know. So can I have a show of hands? How many of you think, how many of you can do it and will do it on a Tuesday evening? OK, well, that answers it. No hands up. So that's the end of the matter. OK, uh, how about Thursday evening? Just, just out of sheer curiosity. All right. OK, so you're, you're, you're on your own for these films. They've been made available to you. Has anyone checked? To s Did you check and see? And they're available? OK, so uh, no excuses. OK? Well, I, I had mentioned that, that that's, you know. But the films are there. So if anyone tells me some story that they can't access it or they didn't see it, well, it's not really my responsibility. All right, I'm, I'm just letting you know you have to have seen the films and you will get questions about the films. So if you're planning on seeing all the films, you know, in one last desperate shot before the final exam is due, remember the length of the films and you will be asked questions about at least five films. So you've got to reckon that that's 15 hours of viewing, which you're going to have to do in sheer desperation. Uh, and for those of you who have had classes with me, you know, you're not going to get Mickey Mouse questions on the exam. I mean, these are real exam essay questions. There are no ID questions, you know, who made Lagan, you know, <laughs> who's the actor, what year was it? No, no, you're going to get an uh, analytical question. So if you haven't seen the films, you will not be in the position of being able to answer the exams. I can assure you that. OK? Any questions? Yes? Just as a general best practice, yeah. would you recommend doing the readings before viewing or vice versa? Vice versa. Okay. 
see the film first. Because what happens invariably is if you do the readings, they inform your reading of the film, their view, their, your view of the film. Um, you should really see these films because uh, before you do the readings, they all have subtitles. And a film is to be seen both to be enjoyed, but of course, I think you already know from the tenor of my remarks that you know, they're, they're like texts. We, we read them. We interpret them. And, and I think I'd like you to go into the film without knowing much about it. And, you know, there are occasionally I have on the syllabus, I hope you've had a really good look at the syllabus. It's a very detailed syllabus. But occasionally I have even given you a wiki page reference. Because I'm not one of these, you know, academics who say, oh, Wikipedia, they all use them anyhow, but some of them don't want to admit it because it's a little below their station in life to admit that, well, they might want to be. But some of the wiki, because some of the films actually which are not that well known actually have a whole wiki page, you know, which is kind of surprising. So uh, once in a while I've given that to you and you can certainly look that up because I'll give you some information uh, on the films and particularly those of you who don't really have a background in Indian cinema whatsoever, you know, right? Because remember that when you go to a film, I mean a lot of people go to a film because, you know, Tom Cruise in it, isn't it? Or, Angelina or whoever their favorite star or actress is, whatever. So in other words, you go into the film with some kind of expectation. This is the lineup. Uh, I look at directors, for example. You know, if, if I know it's a well-known director, I'll go to the film. I don't care what the review says. You know? But those things make a difference. And so to, it's not a bad idea going into it with some information, but the readings are scholarly and analytical, so they're shaping your view. So you should do them after the film, okay? Now, the subject for today's lecture is Indian nationalism. And this is going to be a very quick history, but I'm hoping much more than a Wikipedia history, because you're going to get some real analytical insights, I hope, into how one might think about Indian nationalism and its origins and the various trajectories that it took, because of course the courses on Indian nationalism and cinema, right? But here's a question for you, before we launch into nationalism. Uh, do nations come before nationalism, or does nationalism create nations? Anyone has any thoughts on that? I mean, usually how do you, how do you think, okay, so let me just quickly ask, uh, take a risk, please. You know, this is, yeah, what's nationalism? Uh, I was going to say nationalism comes before nation. Be, nationalism comes before nation. Just, um, um, just an example, like Italy and Germany. And so that, so that, that's, that is the reading that most people will give. That nation, you have a nationalist movement, and what's the outcome of the nationalist movement? It creates a nation. I want to suggest to you it's the opposite. Okay, let me explain why. In order to understand that, first let's talk about very briefly the distinction between a nation and a nation state. There is a difference. The United States, the 191 countries that are represented at the United Nations, you go to the UN building, New York, 191 flags, or whatever the number is. You know, it can change. Sometimes a new nation comes into being. Um, could be 192 next year, you know, but you, you get the picture. So uh, all of these are nation states. They are nation states. They are nation states as opposed to some just being nations. Why? Because these nation states all have a recognized territory with a certain geographical contiguity of the units within it and then there is a border around it. There's a border around it and usually the border is enforced. It's enforced by the military, it's enforced by border security force or whatever that agency may be called in some other country uh, and it's enforced for anyone trying to get into it. You need a document to get in. That document is called a passport. 
I mean, the good old days when you could travel, George Bush got elected president of this country, believe it or not. I mean, it may be apocryphal, this story. I think it's very unlikely that it is I th apocryphal. I think it's entirely true. He didn't even have a passport when he got elected, George Bush, because the only two countries he'd ever been to were Canada and Mexico, and those were the good old days when you didn't need a passport to go to these two countries. They were your backyard anyhow. They belonged to you, you know, although you didn't want to say that. But, I mean, anybody, you're American, you just take a driver's license, you walk into Mexico or Canada. George Bush didn't have a U.S. passport. This man's become the president of the United States. You know, passport is a social document, right, which is what you need to cross borders. Now, this is a nation state. So, a nation state is a nation backed up by a military and a army. So, logically speaking, there has to be then a nation, some example of a nation without a state. Can anyone give me one illustration of a nation without a state? Kurds. Kurds. Another example would have been Armenians. Kurds. Yes. It would have been, but not now. Yeah. Kurds. Palestinians would be the most obvious example of a people who are a nation without a nation state. Right? So a nation is a group of people. Now how you define that is very complicated. I'm not going to attempt to do that right now. Because if you said, I'll just take you there a little bit, on the edge and leave you there. So you think about it. If you said, for example, that a nation is a group of people who share religion in common, well, that's obviously not correct. Not all Palestinians are Muslims. They are Palestinians who are Christians. Right? If you said all people who belong to a nation speak a common language, that's not true. Canada is a country which has two languages minimum, but two official languages, English and French. All right? And so forth and so on. That anything that I gave you in common, if you said a nation is a group of people with a history in common, well, you tell me what is common between the history of the white man in this country and the American Indians. The only thing that is common is that they met and unfortunately one group got completely decimated or wiped out, pretty much. It's, if, 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 if white people told me they have shared memories with American Indians, I, I'd really like to know what those shared memories are. There aren't any, frankly. So forth and so on, you see? So if, you, if I come up with any number of things, I can easily find examples to the, con to the contrary. So it's very difficult to define. But of course, all of these things are of significance. They are consequential. If somebody said not, that this doesn't matter, no, that's not true either. But I'm just saying that it's simply identifying a nation as a group of people who share a language in common or a religion in common, etc., etc., may not be sufficient. Maybe they don't even share a history in common. And I, I've heard explanations in scholarly texts, they have blood in common. I don't know what that means because I, if I prick all of us, the blood is all going to be red, frankly, you know. So, I, so blood is a very mystifying thing. Usually when you, I hear blood, I'm always hearing some gung-ho xenophobic nationalism, nationalists there in the background, right? You know, blood sacrifice, blood in common. No, that doesn't really work. All right, so you, you get the idea now. That first, we, before we really begin to think about nationalism, we have to know that the root th there is the nation and that a nation is a group of people who have some things sufficiently in common, the multitude, that they feel that they belong together in some sense. I'm giving you a very broad. And going back to the question I started with, most people immediately think that you actually have to have nationalism and then that produces a nation. No. In order to produce nationalism, you need to have a nation. What nationalism produces is a nation state. And that's what the Palestinians want. That's what the Kurds want. That's what 
the Basque want. For those of you who know, the Basque are a separatist group in, in Spain who want their own country. All right? Okay, now, let's turn to India, the history of nationalism. Let me just make a few prefatory remarks about the history of India before 1858. Some of you in this room are certainly aware that India was a country that was ruled at least nominally by what was called the East India Company for a period of time. From beginning from 1757, not all of India, because in 1757 portions of Eastern India came under British jurisdiction and the British jurisdiction there was actually a company called the East India Company which was a trading company. But the English did not arrive in India as rulers. They did not arrive in India circa early 1600s with a desire to necessarily conquer India. But they became rulers. This course is not on how they became rulers. So I cannot really enter into that history. For those of you who are interested, you know, I have a course called History of British India which is up on YouTube, the whole course. So you can just go there and you can look up the lectures and you'll get the entire course. All right. So I'm really beginning in midstream because early 1800s, even though the company was still ruling India, it was only nominally ruling, it was really the British crown that was ruling it, that the company had become so big that back in England, the English parliament said, we need to find some ways to exercise control over this company because otherwise a company becomes a state within a state. You know? It's like, for example, if let's say Facebook, to some extent that's already true. It's a state within a state now, which is one reason why you've got this whole problem going on. I mean, Mr. Zuckerberg is in Congress to give testimony, you know, right? Because I, the, the, who's going to exercise control over these mega corporations? Right? That's, but here in India, you have one company ruling over a huge dominion. And Parliament says we're going to exercise jurisdiction, so effectively Parliament is beginning to rule over India, beginning in the early 1800s. There are various small revolts here and there. The biggest revolt against British rule is in 1857-58. The revolt is crushed over a period of several months, almost a year. And at the end of the rule, the East India Company pretty much is dissolved and India becomes a crown colony. And when we say a crown colony, what it means very simply is that India is now being directly ruled by England, by the English Parliament. And of course, there is a person who is appointed from Britain to go to India. That person is going to be called the Viceroy. Right? So India is now, to use a word that we all know, it is a colony of the British. All right? And that's where we're beginning, in a sense. The nationalism is not really going to come to the fore until several decades later. So what you need to understand um, <coughs> is that before we get into the beginnings of nationalism in some formal sense, this, by the way, lays out the agenda. This is a much more extensive agenda, which, and we may not get to all of it, which is fine, uh, but you'll get the gist of it, you know, all right? Um, 1858, India becomes a colony, and for about two decades, two, two and a half decades after that, into the early 1880s, essentially, given the magnitude of the revolt of 1857-1858, which the British crushed, it was a bloody revolt. There were lots of lives lost on both sides. That when, India, when the revolt is crushed, Indians are subdued. For a couple of decades after that, the British are going to now rule without any real opposition. And they're going to use those two, three decades to try to push through what they call reforms. Because of course the view of the, of the British was that, that we have conquered India, India is our domain. This clearly shows that we are a people who have a mission in India. We have a civilizing mission that in some ways we are obviously superior given that India is such a large country and it's of course several times larger than Britain. 
is now under our domain, under our dominion. Right? But by the early 1880s, some Indians are now beginning to think, well, we've been, we're under British rule, but obviously we should be in a position at some point to rule ourselves. And you could say that that's a natural aspiration for mo of most people, right? Wouldn't you say that? That this is the meaning of writing the history history of people as a history of their aspiration to freedom. Right? That's putting it in the broadest possible terms. Right? Before I begin to elaborate on that, just if you look at this slide here, Indian states during the revolt of 1857. So this gives you a little key and it shows you, uh, you know, which were the states that were in uh, rebellion. You can see that uh, there are, uh, you know, only some parts of India which were in rebellion and incidentally only two-thirds of India. India at this time is obviously, does not have the same boundaries as in India of today. The obvious reason for that is 1947 there was a partition of India. So eastern India, this over here, this became Bangladesh, over here this, right? and that on the west became Pakistan, where you see Punjab right there on the left, that portion there, going to the left. Okay, yes? What is Nathan's theory number two? Number, number uh, two. Uh, oh, there, this, this here doesn't give you the full key there because it's one, two, three, four. You see that over there? They've just actually, they haven't, you know, they haven't actually identified them. You don't need to worry about that because that's a technique, that's a detail here that doesn't really concern us. The main thing that you want to look at is if you look at the portion in brown, okay, so there you see British areas affected by rebellion. As opposed to, if you look at the blue, the black, states, what's the difference? Those are native states, meaning only two thirds of the country was officially part of British India one third of the country, the British did not rule directly, but they exercised jurisdiction. So they told these native states they were called, okay? So if you look at, let's say, Kashmir on the top, let's simplify, let's give you a simple illustration. Kashmir on the top, that's an illustration that's worth keeping in mind. Why? Because we're going to get to Kashmir at some point in this course, right? Because Kashmir is now the point of contention between India and Pakistan. All right. So Kashmir was a native state. What does that mean? What it means was that when Britain, Britain was ruling India, even at the height of its rule, it did not rule Kashmir directly. They left the native ruler in place there, but the native ruler did not have the authority to sign treaties with foreign powers. That is the first sign of sovereignty, is when you have political autonomy and you can sign treaties with foreign powers. But the, but the advantage to the British was that if Kashmir is only indirectly under their rule, they don't have to spend that much money and they don't have to have that many troops there. So the, so the ruler of Kashmir gives his allegiance to the crown, to the British crown, but he's able to rule over his own people. Right? But he does not have the power to sign treaties with foreign powers. He does not have the power to obviously appoint ambassadors, right? Or receive ambassadors, so forth and so on. You understand, right? That's what we're talking about. Yes. I have a question. So yeah. Just to be clear, Nepal was never a part of the colony. Ne 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 Nepal is not not Nepal uh, is uh, is not no. It's a separate jurisdiction, but it is under British rule. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's under British rule. Yeah, yeah. Nepal is under British rule. Burma is under British rule. Burma is now known as Myanmar, of course. Bur you know, all of these are under British rule. Yes. All right. Okay. So this is just a, it's the 1857, 18, when the revolt broke out, that was the situation. And then if you look over here, it says India in the 19th century, British expansion, 1805 to 1910. Right, so, and again, this, you, you'd have to look at the key, but what's happening is, so let's take an example. This state here, called Hyderabad, 
very large state. Hyderabad is also is a city. Now if you say Hyderabad, it refers to a city here called Hyderabad. It's even become more complicated now because this place is part of um, Andhra Pradesh and that was carved out. Just a few years ago they created a new state. So this is maybe not a good example because we can, we can complicate it too much. But giving you simply this as an illustration that this is a, you can see how large this state is. It's a native state. The ruler of Hyderabad was the Nizam, re reportedly by far the wealthiest man in the world in his lifetime. Okay, um, And Mysore here is another state. And what's going to happen is that British rule is going to expand by slowly absorbing many of the smaller states. Gandhi himself is born actually on the west coast in a place called Porbandar. We'll get to Gandhi in shortly. And, and that was a native state. It was not part of British India territories. You know. Okay, so uh, British rule expands, but after 1858, pretty much the borders are set. They're not really now absorbing any more territories, but all of these native states are, are under their jurisdiction for the most part. And then this gives you, I'm just giving you a different map here, because this gives it to you with a different clarity. Uh, much simpler, obviously, uh, when you, for example, see a reference to the United Provinces in the readings, then you know what they're referring to. United Provinces, Punjab, Central Provinces. So all of these in the darker shaded, this is all British India. All of these territories in the lighter shade, these are all native states. All of them are native states and remain native states until 1947. And then when partition took place, just to sum up this story, in case you're wondering what happened to these native states when the British left India. Well, they were all given an option. They were given three choices. And we're talking about over 550 native states. The smallest of them would have been the size of UCLA campus. The largest of them, you saw how big that was the Nizam's dominions, right? So when you see Rajputana there, that's actually over a hundred native states all put together. But, the, but that whole area is called Rajputana. Yeah? So what were the three options? The prince or the ruler of that state would sign a treaty agreeing to become a part of India. Option two, be, agree, signs a treaty and agrees to become a part of what? Logically, Pakistan, right? And option three, only in principle, would try to become independent and become an independent country. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Okay? Only options one and two were effectively the options that worked. All right? So now I said to you that we're in the early, we're in the early 18, 80s now, two and a half decades since the passing of, um, since the end of uh, uh, the East India Company uh, and since the time that India became a crown colony. Before I get into the political history of nationalism, it's useful to briefly think about social reform movements. Because nationalism is not simply an expression of the political aspiration to be free. That's the most common meaning that we ascribe to the word. Right? So when we say that the Palestinians are waging a war of nationalism, we understand that to mean that the Palestinians have the political aspiration to create their own nation state. But nationalism also has other components. There's cultural nationalism, there's emotional nationalism, right? And of course, there are various aspects of social nationalism. For example, in this case, what you have to think about is the fact that the British made an argument that one of the reasons that we, we are able to prevail in India over the Indians is because Indians don't know how to treat their women. They don't know how to treat their women. Now why do I give this as an example? 
Because for those of you who are attentive to what happens in world affairs in our times, this argument still persists today. The illustration I would give you of this argument persisting in our age and day is the American invasion of Afghanistan. The problem with Afghanistan, according to every American foreign policy document I've read, is that the Afghans, frankly, the Afghan men, they don't know how to treat their women. Apparently, you don't know how to treat your women, which may be true, but we have to be sure that we know who's speaking here, you know, and what credibility they have to speak as they do. So this was one of the arguments, and I give this as an illustration because this suggests the importance of social reform movements. That if Indians are going to lay a claim, look at it this way, if Indians are going to lay a claim to political independence, the British might say, you know, one of the reasons we are reluctant to allow you political independence is because under our rule, Indian women are much better off than they are under your, the rule of your own men. I mean, they would never state it in such black and white terms most of the time, but that was tacitly always there. So therefore, many Indian nationalists or what today we would call nationalists, also became interested in social reform movements because some seriously thought that, yes, we need to do something to improve the position of women, we need to do something to improve the position who, of other people who are marginalized in our society. Right? And those other people could be lower caste people, they could be Muslims, any number of people. So, in the 19th century, social reform movements, they had been important before too. But since we're looking really at social reform movements in relationship to, to uh, nationalism, what we are interested in is some of the things I've mentioned over here. Uh, all of these, by the way, are quite complicated, obviously, uh, but I just am trying to give you a little bit sense of that. So for example, there is a movement called the Brahmo Samaj. If you look at the top of the slide here, uh, its leader is a man called Ramon Roy. Uh, now we're, this is by the way, before 1857. So that's why I said social reform movement started much earlier. They're gonna pick up steam uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and just to give you, by the way, a general sense of when I talk about social reform movements, what is the range of these movements? All right, so let's, let's take a look very briefly at um, for example, women's education. Right? So the social reformers are going to argue that we need to do something to facilitate the education of women. Right? There are very few women and girls are educated at this point in time. Age of consent bill. Does anybody here know what age of consent bill means? There's a huge controversy over age. So this is the age at which a girl can be viewed as mature enough to give her consent to sexual intercourse, legally, that is. Okay. Right, so, so can she give her consent? Is she mature enough to give her consent at 13, 14, you know, or is it 15, or is it 16? So that's the age of consent bill. And there is a big controversy over it. And you know, some of it might seem, like, what is a controversy about? Yes, there is a controversy about it, just as there was in many other countries at different phases, because in many cultures, the general assumption was, uh, and the preference was that when a girl achieves puberty, she should be married off. And this is, of course, the problem that every society has manufactured for itself, and that has to do with the regulation of female sexuality. You know. Fundamental problem from the point of view of most societies. And remember, we're not talking about 2018. We're talking about the 19th century here. 19th century. I mean, you know, when in the United States women first started wearing trousers, you should look at the literature. I mean, some of the, the, the way that some men wrote about it, they were talking about them as though there's some kind of strange alien who's come from Mars or something, you know. I mean, right? So, so you, have to, you have to remember the debates particular to those times. There are very odd things going on today too, but those are the debates particular to our times, you know. 
All right. So that's what the age of consent bill, widow remarriage. Some Hindu communities, not all. Let us be very clear about that. But in some Hindu communities, when a woman became widowed, the, the rules of her community would not permit her to remarry. Now, you could say it's unjust no matter what her age is. You know, even if she's 60 or 70 and she wants to remarry, she ought. But the problem here is much more acute because many of these widows were child widows. They hadn't even achieved puberty. They've never had sexual relations with any man, including their husband, because they had been married in childhood. And usually when a girl got married in childhood, the marriage is contracted, but she only goes to her husband's home after she achieves puberty. Right? But in the meantime, poor husband, he's died of a cobra bite, and suddenly this girl is a widow. And she can't remarry if she belongs to that particular community which didn't permit it. Right? So, there, so then the social reformer said, well, this is absurd. This is barbaric. You know. And that's what the debate over widow remarriage is. Okay? So this is a kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about social reform movements. And you can see the relationship with nationalism because the obvious question would be what makes it possible for a people to claim political independence if a large segment of the population of that country is not being treated justly anyhow. What difference does it make to an 11 year old girl who's a widow whether she's being ruled by Indians or whether she's being ruled by the British? So there, so, so there are some social reformers who are involved in the political movement who are saying that these two are not separate issues. That we have to have a movement for social reform to alleviate the distress experienced by some portions of our population. Whether they be girls or women or low caste people or whatever the nature of that community. Now, before I proceed any further, any questions? And uh, I think this is a good juncture for me to say, for the obvious reason that we're a small group of people here, that you should really feel free to, as you've already done, feel free to interrupt me to ask questions. I mean, when I cannot answer them simply because, you know, we've got an agenda which is very, very pressing, then I might not do that, but otherwise I'll take questions at any point. Okay? All right. So that's the social reform aspect that I'm talking about. You don't need to worry about all the individuals here at this point that are mentioned by name. You, the point is that these were all important people um, and I've given you a very short idea of what each of these major figures, because they don't really appear in the films that we're talking about. But the issues certainly have to appear in some form or the other in some respects. Okay? Um, at least marginally they do. So when we look at this whole segment called a nation and its values, this is in part what we're talking about. This whole idea that uh, also this idea that India is a land that is eminently spiritual, always has been, you know, and in this spiritual land women understand the position that they have. Because yes, they may not have political rights, but they know that they are the mother of the nation. You know? And of course, the minute you say the mother of the nation, well, veneration and all of that, which may be all you know, a facade, but it's there. Right? You know, for example, if you have conversations with um, Indian middle class families, which are orthodox families, even today, I can tell you, I've heard it so many times, you know, you talk to the men and they'll say, yes, yes, you're, you're right, you know, uh, women, you know, uh, they're not that active in politics, but, you know, the man will tell me, but I can tell you, in my house, the woman rules, 
you know. And I hear this in America too all the time, all the time, you know. The woman rules, right? So this is, this, this is how societies have typically tried to accommodate some of these kinds of considerations, right? All right, now in 1885, uh, there is going to be an organization that's going to be called, it's called the Indian National Congress. But before I get to that, in 1869, we have the birth of a man called Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, um, known in the West as Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma was not his name, that was a title that was conferred on him. Uh, the word Mahatma means great soul. All right. He was born Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi in a place called Porbandar. Uh, and uh, we're going to certainly be looking at Gandhi a bit. This is not a course on Gandhi. I do a whole course on Gandhi. So, uh, you know, that's where I look in much greater detail. Uh, but, but it is important to have some sense of who he is. And I want to begin very briefly with him, very, very briefly, to set the context. So he's born in 1869 in a princely state, also known as a native state. So that, that means that the ruler of that state is semi-independent and much in the way in which I've already described to you. He's educated in Porbandar and in a neighboring town called Rajkot, which is a little bigger town. Rajkot is a bigger town, both in the present, now in the state of Gujarat. Okay, in Western India. And this is not unimportant. Why? Because the Gujaratis have a distinct history within India. All right? Los Angeles, by the way, has a huge Gujarati community, massive, you know. Okay? And uh, the Gujaratis have had a long history in trading and mercantile activities. You know that for centuries, and I'm not exaggerating in the least, for centuries, during the time when the Indian Ocean trading world was the biggest trading system. So the Indian Ocean trading world included all of India, much of Southeast Asia, right to the southeast of India, up and it included on the west, the west coast of Africa, and then it included the Gulf. Okay, and then going up north, South China Seas. That was the Indian Ocean trading system. Right? You could not go to any place, any port there, and not run into a Gujarati. They were there. If I may put it this way, there was a Patel Brothers grocery store in every place. You know. 500, 600, 700 years ago, something of that kind. They were really, now you might say, well, what does the hell does it have to do with that? It does, why? Because it is not an accident that the two most consequential people, all right, the other being Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who is going to become the founder of Pakistan, Eventually, he was going to break away from Gandhi much later on. But I mention this now. Why? Because he was also a Gujarati. He was also a Gujarati. And, you know, if you ever go to Porbandar, you, if almost no matter where you are, within 10 minutes, you're on the coastline and you can just see you're looking out to the world. Mohandas Karamjan Gandhi was looking out to the world long before he left Porbandar. Right? And he finishes his schooling in India and then he's going to go to London. He's going to go to London and I want to tell you this now because this, you're not going to see that in any of the films that we're going to look at having to do with Gandhi, but this has very much to do with the question of nationalism because I don't want you to walk away from this course after 10 weeks simply thinking of nationalism as the struggle for political freedom. Of course, that was the main element of it, but there was a lot more than that. So what's the story I want to tell you? The story I want to tell you is that after he finished his schooling, what did Gandhi do? Anyone? Somebody must know. You must know, Anya. 
Where did Gandhi go? To went to London. He went to London to get a degree, to become credentialed in law. By the way, of all the major nationalist figures, 80% of them were trained as lawyers. All right? So he goes to London, but before he goes to London, and this is the key story. Before he goes to London, his mother says, my dear son, I can't let you go. Not, not overseas because you're going to get contaminated. Now, I won't get into the strict rules about caste and all of that, but, but contamination here is that you're going to get contaminated by the West. The West is a place that's polluting. Right? But Gandhi insists, and he says, I'm going to go. I'm giving you the truncated version, of course. But before he goes, she extracts three promises from him. And this is really about nationalism, because it's about a nation and its values. What are the three promises that Gandhi had to give to his mother before he could go to London and spend three years there? That he would not touch wine, meaning alcohol, in the generic sense. He would not touch women. He would not get lured by white women and enticed by them. He was already married, by the way. When he went, you know, his, he was in his teens, which was a fairly advanced stage to get married, if I may say so, at that point, you know, all right? So both he and his young bride, they're, they're in their early teens when they get married. But he left his wife behind, he left Kasturba behind. Kasturba was not educated, for the most part. And his mother extracted the promises that he promised that he wouldn't go there and enter into sexual, you know, or amorous relationships with other women. And the third promise, he wouldn't touch flesh. He wouldn't become a meat eater. He came from a Vaishnava family, right? Uh, Vaishnava, Vaishnavas are people who are, uh, they belong to a, you know, when people generally speak of Hinduism as a monolithic entry, but they're, uh, entity, but there are many kinds of Hindus, and one uh, very large group of people is the Vaishnavas, and the Vaishnavas are people who uh, not always, but generally follow vegetarianism. Okay? And you have to remember that vegetarianism is like a religion in itself to many people, even today in a country like India. I know that it is to some people here too. I mean, vegans can be very strict and very autocratic, you know, uh, about their veganism. But in India, vegetarianism had a very long history and still is followed by a good number of people, not by the majority of Indians, not by any stretch of the imagination, but India has a longer history of vegetarianism and is associated with a vegetarian cuisine of a complexity that cannot be approximated anywhere in the world, not even remotely. And he came from a very strict vegetarian family, so his mother was worried that he would go to the West and one of the signs of the barbarism of the West for her was, they all eat meat, you know? Which was not off the mark, not, not her assessment that they're bar barbaric because they eat meat, but that they all eat meat. She's not off the mark. And particularly, Mohandas, you know, you go to England in 1880, you know what vegetarian food meant was boiled peas and carrots. That's what you got, you know? I mean, really rotten food. That's one reason why England had to colonize India, of course, so that they could learn to eat well. I mean, my God, English, English food is the worst th possible thing in the world you can imagine, you know, uh, before they became civilized by their encounter with others who had better food. Uh, so this was part of, this is part of the story of nationalism. Right? You see, you see what I'm suggesting to you? Because the whole idea is that this, these are the values of us as a people. Our vegetarianism. 
And then you might think, well, but let's go further. Yes, because for example, the whole idea was that vegetarianism civilizes you. People who eat meat tend to be, tend to have too many rough edges. The, there's too much masculinity in those cultures. And when Gandhi was growing up, there used to be a doggerel, a verse, which used to be very common in his times. Because of course every Indian was thinking about one thing. What were they thinking about? How is it that we as a people are being ruled by a little country called England? And so what was that doggerel verse? That doggerel verse was, well, one of the reasons we are being ruled by them is because yeah, we eat dal. You know what dal, uh, for those of you who don't know, dal is uh, lentils. But, you know, it's, if, don't go to Ralph's and pick up lentils and think you're picking up dal. No, because there are actually like 30 kinds of dal. And uh, this is the main source of protein. Pulses is the formal word, pulses. But if I say pulses here, nobody understands pulses. You know, they think I'm talking about some pulse, you know. Uh, pulses. That's the main source of protein. And so that doggerel verse was, well, the reason why we get ruled by these six feet tall Englishmen is because they're meat eaters. They're meat eaters. Right? So I could... I could develop this. I could give you a five-hour lecture on vegetarianism and all its cultural associations with the nation. But I'm giving you a little clue about why you should not imagine that this is something completely different than the phenomenon that we are calling nationalism. All right? So Gandhi, you get the early history. Let's leave him aside now. 1885. The Indian National Congress is founded. Very important. Although in the films that you see, there's hardly any mention. But you have to know the history very briefly. This was an organization that was founded. Its early membership consisted of about 70 people. And they were beginning to ask this question that I've already put on the table for you. How is it that we are being ruled as a people by someone else? And then what can we do about it? And if you said, well, what kind of grievance did they have? Well, other than the fact that no one likes to really be ruled by someone else, that is someone who is alien to your culture, right? The illustration and again it's an illustration, would be that if you look at India, like any country, whether it's a sovereign country or a colonized country, it has an administrative structure. Right? So if you look at the political structure of the United States, well we know that there are people who exercise power. I'm not just talking about the White House, I'm talking about Bureaucrats, the civil services, right? Who staffs the State Department? Who staffs the FBI? Who staffs the Homeland Security? These are bureaucrats. And how do you become a bureaucrat? You sit for an exam. And so in India, you had what was called the Indian Civil Service. And you would sit for the exam. And if you pass the exam, you, get, you got appointed and you became the head of a district, which might have, let's say, a million people. However, in 1885, when the Indian National Congress was founded, there were no Indians in the Indian Civil Service. All the positions were staffed by Englishmen. And not only that, you couldn't even take the Indian Civil Service exam in India. You had to go to Britain to take the exam. So here you're an Indian, you are educated, you have some aspiration to serve your country, but before you can do that, you've got to get on a ship, spend a month traveling to London, and pay your own way. I mean, that's quite astonishing if you think about it. It would be like saying, hmm, 
Let's make sure that anybody who wants to serve in the American Foreign Service, they don't have to go to Moscow to take the exam. You know, I, a lot of takers for that. I, I, I can see that, right? It's just extraordinary. So what is their demand? Their demand is that they have many demands that the Indian Civil Service exam should be administered in India. Yes, you can administer in England too for those Englishmen who want to join, but it should also be administered in India. So they're saying that Indians should have a greater role in governing themselves. Representation, they should have more political representation. But what was the procedure that the, that the Indian National Congress used for at least 10, 12 years? Petition. You, you write a letter to the Governor General, to a senior English official saying, dear sir, you know, we would like to have more voice in the affairs of our own country, so forth and so on. And the petitioning went on for 10, 12 years. And after that, people in the Indian National Congress certainly realized it wasn't going to get them very far. However, within a decade, already a different strand. So now we have, we're beginning the formal history of political nationalism, right? The Indian National Congress is one strand. Then the second strand is within a decade, you have political leaders who are saying, this is not getting us anywhere. And who are much more aggressive. The Indian National Congress in its early years was not an aggressive organization. These were all gentlemen. You know, they all wore suits and ties. They were all anglicized. Most of them were highly anglicized. Most of them had law degrees. But by within a decade after the founding of the Indian National Congress, there's going to be a group of political radicals who are going to say, no, 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 we need to be much more aggressive. Not only that, what is the key element that is missing in the story of nationalism thus far? The key element that's missing is how do you think you can achieve political goals when it's a handful of you elites? Where are the masses? The masses have not come into politics yet. So Bal Ganga Dartilak, whom you see here, 1856 to 1920, is going to be one of the first people in India who is going to start to politicize. Okay? Different aspects of Indian culture and society, particularly religion. Because he is thinking to himself, how do I mobilize the masses? How do I mobilize the masses? Right? How do I bring them into the domain of politics? And I have to remind you that the phrase the masses is not just a colloquial expression. It is that. But it's more than that. Because the first time really that the masses entered into the stage of history when they become a potent force was the French Revolution. Some people would say the American Declaration of Independence, you know, American Revolutionary War, I have some quibbles with that, but if you want to date back to that, fine. But no, the masses as a distinct entity in world history, as a force, they really come into play during the French Revolution. In India, it was Bal Gangatar Tilak who brought the masses. And how did he do it? So I said he mobilized. That begs the question, how did he mobilize? One of the ways in which he mobilized was he took a festival, the Ganesh Utsav. You see that on the third bullet point there. So the Ganesh Utsav is festival. Ganesh is a festival in honor of the Hindu god Ganesha. You all of you have seen. Right? He is the, the, the elephant belly god. Right? Okay? Very fun looking god by the way. That's a nice thing about Hinduism. You know, the, some of the gods and goddesses are so attractive, I can't tell you. you know? um, no austerity in that religion. This is not Islam or Protestant Christianity. Christianity had that. But then of course the Protestants came around, came around and threw it all out. They didn't want any saints, they didn't want them, you know, any of these icons. You know, they just wanted something austere and simple. So there we go, and especially in America, you're the Puritans, you know, and all of that. That's why they're called the Puritans, among other reasons, you know. But Ganesh, Utsav, 
And the Ganesh Utsav, what do you do? You can, by the way, it takes place in, in India every year. And you go to Bombay, it's, it's chaotic. I mean, it's, it's a massive festival. And you build images of Ganesh, and then you take them out in a procession, hundreds and thousands of these images all over. And then you immerse them into a body of water. So he politicizes it. Because so many people are gathered, he starts giving lectures. And then invokes the Hindu gods and says, well, why are Hindu gods asleep? Why don't they do something about this demon called the white man? Right? And he riles up the crowd. This is a, a different phase of nationalism now. All right? That's where the political radicals are coming in. And some of them begin to take up arms. 1897, beginning of armed revolutionary violence. I'm using the conventional phrase. I don't call it revolutionary. Okay? These were patriots, unquestionably. They were patriots, but they did what armed patriots do. You engage in random acts of violence to inflict chaos to disrupt. So what would you do? You might, you might blow up a railway line. You might blow up a police station. You disrupt the flows of communication, flows of goods. You assassinate an official who appears particularly oppressive. Targeted assassination. Right? So that's, what, that's the beginning of armed revolutionary violence. And again, I've given you more detail here than I'm talking about because it may be useful when you're looking at some of the films. You can always go back to these slides which will be posted for you, as I said. So 1898, the British are finally going to arrest Tilak on charges of sedition. They're going to put him, in, on, put him on trial, right? And I want to get to the next stage, which is 1905, the partition of Bengal and what is called the Swadeshi movement. But 1905 was important for one other reason, and then I'll turn to the partition of Bengal. The Russo-Japan War, Russian-Japan War of 1905. Why is that important to Indian nationalism, you think? Anyone wants to make a conjecture? Yes? That's it, in a nutshell. You're absolutely right. It was a matter of great inspiration to Indian nationalists to find that another Asian country had inflicted defeat on a major European power. And if you read Nehru's autobiography or you read the works of other Indian nationalists, they tell you that when the news came to India that the Japanese had defeated the Russians, there was exhilaration. They were overjoyed. He said, hey, if, if the Japanese can defeat the Russians, it shows that we Asians can do all kinds of things. I mean, even the Vietnamese, when they defeated the, the mightiest military machine in the world, I'm talking about the U.S. and the Vietnam War, right? which is what happened. The U.S. lost that war. There's no other way to write it. I know there are all kinds of historians who keep on trying to, you know, spin their fingers around it and saying, no, it was a retreat, you know, it was... No, no, no. They lost the war. That's what happened. And they lost the war. And now you'll think this is one of Vinay's, uh, Lal's characteristic jokes. No, no, these all have histories. Nobody, you know, it, the great European theorists always argued... This is what is called geographical determinism, allied to food. So there were European theorists in the 17th century who basically said you can divide up all the people into the world into three groups. Wheat eating, rice eating, potato eating. And then there are a few people here and there who eat other things, you know. But main grain. And the idea was that the rice eating are the weakest of the lot. So when the rice-eating Vietnamese defeated the Americans, you know, I had a big celebration of rice that day, I can tell you. I remember that. You know? I said, yeah. This is the kind of thing we're talking about. And this is what the Russian-Japanese war signified. 
That's why it's important in the history of Indian nationalism. But 1905 was also the year of the Swadeshi movement. Okay, so now we need to spend just a couple of minutes on that. All right, and that will take us to pretty much the most important things that you need to know as we move into the next segment of the course. So what is the Swadeshi movement? Let me, this by the way is Tilak. This is a post-it stamp issued by the Indian government. Okay, so one of the slogans that he became important for when he was put on political trial, he stood up and shouted, Swaraj is my birthright. Right? Swa. So I want you to take note of this prefix Swa, S-W-A, which is in this word Swaraj, right at the bottom right, you see that? Swaraj, okay? And then the word that I just mentioned to you, which I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this, Swadeshi, right? So you see the same prefix, okay? And what does the word Swa mean? One zone. So Swaraj is one's own rule, when you rule yourself, right? And so his slogan was, Swaraj is my birthright. That is, it is my birthright to rule over myself. Right? I don't want an alien power to rule over me. And so the, and this is, this is set to a painting, by the way, by the famous Indian painter M.F. Hussein. So anyhow, a small portion of a huge painting and the Indian, I just, the reason I, I instead of showing you a portrait of uh, Tilak, I showed you this post-it stamp because you can see how the memory of Tilak lives on in India today. This is a visual text, just like a film is, right? So, uh, so, so uh, Swadeshi movement, uh, and, and just one, before I get to that, uh, I want you to keep this in mind because I want to, and that's why I deliberately interjected it at this stage here, it's also important to point out the obvious limitations of some of these people. The greatest limitation of Tilak might have been that he began to be seen as not just a nationalist, but as what kind of nationalist do you think? Hindu nationalist, Hindu nationalist. He began to be seen as a Hindu nationalist. The Muslims were suspicious of him. Because remember he mobilized for a, the Ganesh festival. These are all Hindus. So the obvious question that is going to arise for some people is that Yes, some nationalists are making some kind of claims about ruling their own country, but how inclusive is this nationalism? We know, for example, that American nationalism in the 1770s, which led to the American Revolutionary War, was not inclusive. If it was inclusive, you, wouldn't, you would have had the end of slavery. You didn't. Right? So this is, question is going to arise when we look at Indian nationalism as well. And Tilak was a person who began to be seen as a Hindu nationalist and even today by the way he has a reputation as a Hindu nationalist so now that is why I interjected this slide here because the British of course are very aware of the different religious constituencies in India in fact they're going to take advantage of that because the British claim is going to be that a Hindu is always a Hindu before he is an Indian a Muslim is always a Muslim before he or she is an Indian. A Sikh is always a Sikh before he or she is an Indian. But we, the British, we transcend all these differences. That's, of course, absolute nonsense. But that was the claim. We are a transcendent power. We are here to keep the peace between these people. Otherwise, they'll tear each other apart. So, th th because this map, why do they produce this map? This is, map is produced by the British. They're showing you, okay, prevailing religions in India. And then they have the key there. Note to coloring on the left there. Okay, Mohammedan. Mohammedan means Muslim. Buddhism, Hindu, 
Christians, so forth and so on. All right? they, they're showing you what is a, so you can see the, the, in the middle it's that shade of, what is that color called? Uh, some kind of pinkish, you know, right? Uh, and then you see a, a darker shade there because that's a concentration of Muslims, all right? You, you, you remember this, but this slide I will post for you. This is Muslims here, okay? Muslims over there, over there, and so forth and so on. The, the, sorry, the, the, not, not this, the green. That, that's, uh, you know, all of the green there, this, these are Muslim majority, and then you find uh, a few others. So this yellow is, is guess what? Bur Buddhist, right? Burma is largely Buddhist. Not entirely, of course. All right, so, so because now we're in the early 1900s, remember, right? And what we're talking about is these strands of nationalism that are emerging. You've, some of this slide will already make sense to you now, but not all of it because we haven't gotten into it. But I want to, want to spend the remaining two, three minutes before we disperse for today on the Swadeshi movement. Because 1905 was the year, as I said, which is important both because of the Russian defeat at the hands of Japan, and secondly, the beginning of the Swadeshi movement. Now, the masses had come into politics as a consequence of what Tilak had done, correct, in Western India, but that's still relatively small pockets. The Swadeshi movement was a much larger movement. Eastern India, covered Eastern India. The occasion for it was the British took the province of Bengal, the large province of Bengal, and they said we're dividing it. And what they did was they divided it along religious lines. So what you see, by the way, today as Bangladesh, Okay, the, I'm, not, I'm not saying the borders correspond today to what the partition was in 1905, but there's some slight correspondence. Because Eastern Bengal was largely Muslim, Western Bengal was largely Hindu. Now the reason they divided it is because the British are already beginning to see the emergence of Indian nationalism, they're getting worried. Because obviously it's a threat to their rule. And they claim that Bengal is so large unwieldy, they can't manage it, and we're going to divide it. And yes, very conveniently, they divided it along religious lines, which was, of course, partially an attempt to make sure that the Hindus and the Muslims would be at loggerheads with each other. So this is going to evoke a response, and that response is called the Swadeshi movement. So the word Swa, one's own, Desh, country. So this is a movement which is stressing Obviously nationalism, we want our own country, but Swadeshi also means self-help, self-reliance, right? You rely upon your resources, don't go to the British for everything. So for example, where were Indians being educated? In schools run by the British. One of the consequences of the Swadeshi movement was a number of Indians set up their own schools. Said we're not going to send because of course they're, they're basically being educated in a certain way to believe in certain things, right? Atma Shakti, Atma, soul, Shakti, strength. Learn to cultivate the strength of your own soul. Cultivate your own resources. And the political end of Swadeshi movement many, meant many things. For example, boycott of British goods, bonfires of British textiles. So everyone in Bengal who was wearing foreign made clothes, manufactured largely in England, right? imported into India, the raw material has been taken from India, you, Indians are basically buying back now as shirts or trousers or blouses or whatever it is, the cotton that they had sent but they're paying a much larger price for it with tariffs. Right? And so in many places in Bengal, they would encourage people to bring all the textiles in their home, which were British manufactured, they would put, up, put them in this huge bonfire and they would, they would light them up. Right? So, so, the, so mass campaigns 
boycott of British goods, withdrawal from British run schools, I've already mentioned that village improvement, so, the, so that was the other aspect where this goes back to that social reform movement angle, that we need to improve the standards of living of people living in villages. Even the Swadeshi movement, this is far too complicated for me to enter into in any detail for a course of this kind, but even the Swadeshi movement, there were lots of questions about whether Muslims were adequately represented or not. Did they take part? Were they coerced? Were Muslims sometimes coerced by Hindus to burn their clothes that were manufactured? And, and yes, they were very delicate questions because uh, sometimes these manufactured textiles, because they're manufactured in large numbers, right? It's like the things that come from China. They're much more expensive than the clothes made in Japan. Well, everything made in China is much cheaper than anything made anywhere else. Partially, it's the economy of scales, right? You're talking about you know, millions or billions of items. It's proportionately less expensive. So what is the relevance here? The relevance is that you know, a poor villager may be wearing a shirt made in England, but if he were to wear a handmade Indian shirt, it's five times more expensive sometimes. Right? So, it, it, so there was sometimes there was coercion. And, some, and many Indians were encouraged not to pay land tax, property tax. You know? right? Because that tax was obviously a main source of revenue for the British government. So if you, you, this is one way to bleed them. Right? So that's what the Swadeshi movement was. And I want to end with a recommendation. I know you have enough films to watch, so you don't, but you don't have to watch this. But this is a gorgeous film. And it's not a mainstream Hindi film, which is why it's not part of this course. And it's made by one of the greatest directors in cinematic history in the world, you know, who got a lifetime Oscar. Not that it matters to me, really, these things, but some people think that that signifies ultimate genius. Lifetime Oscar from the American Motion Picture Academy. I'm talking about Satyajit Ray. R-A-Y is the last name of the director, Satyajit Ray. He made a film called The Home and the World. And it's all about the Swadeshi movement. Gorgeous film. And not very long, because this is not a mainstream commercial film. So this is less than two hours long. You know? uh, based on a famous novel, which I'm using for my seminar class this term, um, and the novel has got the same name, The Home and the World, by Rabindranath Tagore, a major figure, of course, in the history of India, first half of the 20th century, right? So if you get a chance, try to see if you can watch the film, The Home and the World. I think it's on Netflix, by the way, I, and I think it's on YouTube, um, <clears throat> and a pretty good print, if I recall correctly. Um, but I can always have it put on reserve if someone is really interested and they can't get their hands on it. All right, so uh, unfortunately we have to stop because uh, it's past time already. Uh, so Thursday, be prepared to discuss Divar. All right, and make sure you've read my little book on it. <laughs>